In 1994, Sega continued their domination of the American video game market with more Sonic than ever before. As a matter of fact, weeks ago when this was announced, people literally canceled vacations that they were going to take so that they could be here to see uh, the Sonic the Hedgehog balloon and be able to play the game uh, for the first time in the world. A year-long strategy that had a little help from a small town icon. By Downcore, we're here in Punxsutawney, Pennsylvania, the weather capital of the world, and we wish you a happy Groundhog Day. To learn all about this unusual campaign and marketing strategy, stay here for the story of Sonic the Hedgehog 3. In January 1994, when the dust had settled from the 93 Christmas season, Sega found itself on top again, ahead of their main rival, Nintendo. Most figures from that era will estimate a 60-40 split. In hard numbers, the Sega Genesis reached lifetime sales of 13.5 million units, while the Super Nintendo Entertainment System reached 11.3 million. In one year, Sega sold almost 6 million units, about 1.5 million more than Nintendo. Sega had moved from profits of a few million dollars just a few years before to 3.6 billion at the end of 1993. The rise of Sega, led by CEO Tom Kalinske, was documented throughout the media. Nintendo was no slouch during this period, with quality software and aggressive pricing, but fell short for the last three years, the entire lifetime of the Super NES. The battles of Sega and Nintendo, which later came to be known as the Console Wars, were a boom for everyone. Hundreds of great 16-bit games on hardware that cost $99. There was much to be excited about, whether you owned a Genesis or SNES, and by 1994, more than a few had both. The origins of Sega's 90s success came from Sonic the Hedgehog. The character was placed front and center as the face of the company, offering a more exciting alternative to Mario. The games were fast-paced, exciting, and colorful, showing off the best graphics the Genesis could pull off. Sonic also made it to the portable Game Gear, and in some areas, the 8-bit Master System. Sonic reached maximum exposure on November 24, 1992, with a historic first for video games. A simultaneous worldwide launch for Sonic the Hedgehog 2, Sonic Tuesday. Sega followed up the next year with Sonic Mania Day on November 23rd, 1993. Rather than Sonic 3, the public was given three Sonics, with Sonic CD on the Sega CD, Sonic Spinball on the Genesis, and Sonic Chaos on the Game Gear. Despite the quality offerings of Sonic Mania Day, the demand for Sonic 3 was intense and only grew over time. How Sonic 3 became what it was all stemmed from the development of Sonic 2. That game was produced out of Sega's American offices in a special division created to foster game development on that side of the Pacific. The Sega Technical Institute, STI for short. Mark Cerny, who had experience with Sega in Japan, managed incoming talent, allowing for much more creative freedom than Sega allowed in Japan. This mix led to Sonic 2 being developed with Japanese and American designers working side by side, led by Sega veteran Yuji Naka, with oversight from the home offices in the US and Japan. The final product was one of the greatest 16-bit video games of all time, but one that gave way to tensions that almost derailed any future games. Before Sonic 3 got off the ground, Yuji Naka refused to continue with STI, if American staff were involved. The difference in language, culture, and managerial styles were sources of frustration for many during the Sonic 2 project. Yuji Naka felt that the next game would be produced more smoothly and come closer to his creative vision with fellow Japanese collaborators. As for Mark Cerny, he had left the company near the end of Sonic 2. His replacement, Roger Hector, heeded to Yuji's demands. American members of STI were sent elsewhere, locked out of Sonic 3. Hirokazu Yasuhara, aka Carol Yass, was made director while Yuji Naka was made producer, as well as programmer, now together for the third time in a row. Takashi Izuka would join as a newcomer to the series as a designer, 
while several others were flown in from Japan to fill different roles. One key player from Sonic's past would be absent, Masato Nakamura, the composer of the first two games. As a member of the Japanese pop band Dreams Come True, he saw his star rise and take off. His band had become the most popular and best-selling group in Japan. With a busier schedule and higher profile, Sega and Nakamura could not come to an agreement, parting ways before Sonic 3 was anything more than an idea. For a short while, another name was considered. Michael Jackson. A familiar face in the world of gaming, thanks to Sega. Moonwalker, based on Michael's 1988 musical film, was converted into a video game for arcades, the Genesis, and the Master System. Michael's face was prominent in early 90s Sega advertising. While Moonwalker is what most think of in regards to Sega and Michael Jackson, a new project appeared in 1993, Michael Jackson in Scramble Training, a full motion video ride game released exclusively at Sega game centers in select locations around the world. During the production of Scramble Training, Michael and Sega expressed interest in working together on Sonic 3. For a number of weeks in mid-1993, Michael produced a number of tracks that were then sent to Sega. The two camps met on occasion at Neverland Ranch. The entire project was kept secret and ultimately went nowhere. Michael was not credited, nor was any mention of him ever uttered by Sega. Many years after Sonic 3, rumors began to circulate that some of the in-game music sounded similar to Michael Jackson's songs and style, particularly Carnival Night Zone sounding similar to Jam from the Dangerous album. Roger Hector confirmed the truth about Michael's contributions, while musician Brad Buxer confirmed that he was hired by Michael to compose music for the game. Michael himself never commented on Sonic 3 in any way. In the end, Tokuhiku Uwabo, often simply referred to as Bo, became the man in charge of sound production, with newcomer Jun Senue also joining the team, starting a long musical career with Sonic right here. In the early stages of production, STI made attempts at implementing 3D graphics and perspectives to the game, using polygons and a special chip that would eventually be used in Virtua Racing. The efforts in regards to Sonic 3 did not produce something advanced enough to warrant further development. The 3D style was abandoned after a few weeks of progress in favor of the traditional 2D multi-track style of the other Sonic games. The graphical style did use some 3D imaging software to achieve a style that looked more detailed and realistic. Still, the majority of on-screen elements were drawn pixel by pixel, the traditional way, including Sonic, who was redesigned to look more like a 3D rendered image. All of these grand plans and stumbling blocks along the way dragged down the project. Only a few months into 1993, it was clear that Sonic 3 would not go on sale that year. The American members of STI created Sonic Spinball to fill the gap with Sonic 3 moving to an unknown date in 1994. As the Sonic Mania Day campaign ran its course, the elements of Sonic 3 that were finished could constitute enough for a standalone game, though it was not the full picture Yuji Naka had envisioned. When STI presented the completed parts of the project to the home offices in Japan, a controversial idea was broached. Release the game in two parts something that had never been successfully done before in the home video game space. Consumers could have viewed such a maneuver as lazy by releasing a half-finished game, or a cash grab by forcing everyone to buy essentially the same game twice. Furthermore, with two separate cartridges, there could never be a feeling across the board that a hypothetical Sonic 3 Parts 1 and 2 were actually the same game. But the hardware division offered a solution a contraption they had been working on for a while. A cartridge that could accept other cartridges and combine the game codes of both. The concept began a while before Sonic 3, when Sega partnered with Galoob and Codemasters for the Game Genie enhancement device. The partnership gave Sega their own ideas about how to create a similar product of their own. When STI was presented with a device that could make two games work as one, the call was made. Split Sonic 3 in half and sell two individual cartridges that, when combined, make one complete game. With the plans in motion, the stages that were completed were polished up and put together for the first game, officially Sonic the Hedgehog 3. 
The second game, still unfinished, was kept secret, with a release scheduled for the second half of 1994, very likely the same day as Sonic 2 and CD, the Tuesday before Thanksgiving. Sonic 3 is coming. Look for the shadow! On Groundhog Day. Let's make that Hedgehog Day. Did you see the shadow? Sonic 3, February 2nd. With Sonic Tuesday and Mania Day still fresh in the minds of the public, Sega had to come up with something that equaled those past events. One problem that stood in the way was that Sega was already promoting three other Sonic games, while Sonic 3 was ready to roll. Sega kept Sonic 3 a secret and away from the media. There were a few blurbs about a third Sonic game, but otherwise, not a single screenshot of Sonic 3 was ever shown until January 1994 at the Winter Consumer Electronics Show. Sega dropped a bomb and let everyone know that Sonic 3 was coming in 94. In fact, the game was ready and almost here. A new full-fledged Sonic game seemingly fell out of the sky. It was almost serendipitous as the best marketing opportunity for Sonic was happening in real time alongside the development of the game. One of the biggest box office draws of 1993 was a sleeper comedy, Groundhog Day. The movie, directed by Harold Ramis, starring Andy McDowell and Bill Murray, takes place during the annual Groundhog Celebration, an event that has been held on February 2nd in the town of Punxsutawney, Pennsylvania, since the 1880s. There had always been local TV news coverage of the event, with a paragraph or two nationally, but for the most part, Groundhog Day was unknown outside of Western Pennsylvania. The movie brought the importance of February 2nd to the mainstream, as many Americans learned that the bizarre ritual of checking the shadow of a groundhog to predict the weather was actually real. During production, which took place in 1992, the town of Punxsutawney was considered for filming. However, a lack of interesting exterior locations led to Groundhog Day being filmed in Illinois. The decision angered those in Punxsutawney, who then refused to allow Phil, the real groundhog, to be used in the movie. Sega tapped into the rising interest in the event, offering to debut Sonic the Hedgehog 3 in Punxsutawney, PA. The town was more than happy to roll out the red carpet for Sonic, declaring February 2nd, 1994, Hedgehog Day. Prior to the release of the Groundhog Day movie, the event drew only a thousand or so people at best. With the raised curiosity of February 2nd, many around the United States began to plan a voyage to the real Punxsutawney PA to see the real Groundhog in action. The 1994 turnout broke all records, with attendance in the tens of thousands, each one a potential customer for Sonic the Hedgehog 3. The famous Sonic hot air balloon flew high in the sky as the first copies of Sonic 3 in the world were put on sale. The actual Groundhog ceremony is usually over around 8 a.m., but in 1994, the celebration could continue all day with Sonic. The local junior high school was transformed into a free arcade, where everyone could try out the new game. We should be in wrestling practice, but this is more fun. <laughs> if I get straight A's, my mom's gonna buy me the Sales in the small town were strong, selling out by the end of the day. Based on everything that Sega is doing to launch the game and the anticipation from the kids, we think that uh, Sonic 3 should be one of the biggest games perhaps of all time on video game platforms. And just for the record, Punxsutawney Phil did see his shadow in 1994, meaning six more weeks of winter. What those lucky first few, and soon the whole nation, would experience was a game that outclassed Sonic 2 in every way. A feat that seemed impossible considering the popularity and critical acclaim that game had. As a direct sequel, the third game followed the events of the second, expanding the story and adding new characters. At the end of Sonic 2, West Side Island was liberated from the evil Dr. Robotnik, with Sonic retrieving the seven Chaos Emeralds and knocking Robotnik's space station, the Death Egg, out of orbit. The space station crashed to Earth, landing on the mysterious floating Angel Island. 
The collision forced the island to sink back into the ocean, causing a tidal wave that reached the home of Sonic and Tails, prompting him and Tails to leave in the tornado at once to investigate. Angel Island is home to Knuckles the Echidna, the last of his kind, with the sworn duty to protect the Chaos Emerald Altars that dot the island. Not long after the collision, Robotnik, while searching for the Death Egg, meets Knuckles. Pretending to be a friendly scientist, he earns the trust of the Echidna, claiming that the recent disruptions were the cause of Sonic and Tails, who must be stopped to save the Angel Island Emeralds. Knuckles sides with Robotnik, presenting a new adversary for our heroes, the instant they arrive. It's up to Sonic and Tails to rescue the Emeralds, stop Robotnik, and convince Knuckles of the truth. As a continuation of the series, all of the majority elements that were included in past Sonics are here. Naturally, Sonic is fast, as fast as ever. Tails can be controlled by a second player or letting the computer take over. All the Sonic hallmarks are here. Rings, loops, spikes, springs, the spin dash, supersonic, you name it. All of it has that classic feel, balancing fast speed with exploration at a cautious pace. What's new to Sonic 3 is quite noticeable upon first play, showing an amazing jump in performance over the second Sonic. The zones and acts are the largest ever. Each act is between two and three times larger than those of past games. The acts are also seamless, meaning that the second starts immediately after completing the first, in the same space with no transitions or wait time. The first act pits Sonic against a mini-boss, while the second is a battle with Robotnik. There are six zones in all, similar to the number of the other games, but the size and scope of each one makes it feel like a much larger game. With so many things to explore in Sonic 3, the game features battery backup with multiple save files. Backgrounds and foregrounds are fully animated, often changing as the zone progresses. Each of the six acts have amazing graphical detail and rarely repeat the same color, offering eye-popping visuals from start to end that make you wonder how these graphics are handled while Sonic moves along at amazing speed. The long and windy tubes of Hydra City Zone, the bouncy obstacles in Carnival Night Zone, and the snowboarding in Ice Cap Zone add to the fun and challenge that, while new, have a familiar hint of previous Sonic stages. Hand launchers and bananas also add a comical element. The Chaos Emeralds are retrievable in special stages, like always. In Sonic 3, these are accessible through giant rings that appear in several places, without any requirements. The special stage is all new. Sonic navigates a rotating 3D globe, littered with red and blue spheres. Sonic must collect all of the blue spheres as the speed increases. Touch a red one, and you're out. There are also rings to collect and bumpers that push Sonic back, adding to the challenge. There is a second special stage, accessible in a way similar to Sonic 2. If Sonic or Tails has 50 rings, or more, then passes a goalpost, a gateway will open to a gacha machine, where Sonic bounces around collecting power-ups, rings, and extra lives. One bonus can replenish the red springs below that vanish with each bounce, allowing the stage to continue almost indefinitely. There are three new shields, each with special powers. These work similar to the original shield, protecting Sonic and Tails from one hit from an enemy. The Aqua Shield allows for free movement underwater without having to search for an air bubble. Sonic can also bounce on the ground with this item. The Flame Shield protects against fire-based hazards, making it easier to run through places that are ablaze. Sonic can turn into a giant fireball with each jump for extra protection. The Thunder Shield protects from electrical hazards in a manner similar to the Flame Shield. The Thunder Shield also attracts nearby rings, making them easier to collect, and allows Sonic to perform a double jump. As well, each of these three shields won't disappear after contact with minor airborne projectiles sent out from enemies such as Bluminators and Clamors. Even without a shield, Sonic can generate a temporary one with a double spin attack. Pressing A, B, or C while in mid-air will create a barrier that lasts for just one second. The split-screen two-player competition mode makes a return. Rather than simply finishing the zone, like in Sonic 2, the goal is to be the fastest in a five-lap run through select stages. The player is offered the choice of individual races or the Grand Prix, featuring every stage. Knuckles is playable here as well. He can climb walls and glide in the air, offering different strategies compared to Sonic or Tails. There's also a solo time attack mode that can be used to practice or compare your best times with friends. All of this was packed into a 16 megabit cartridge, 
twice the size of Sonic 2, but certainly feeling much more than double in challenge, fun, and replay value. If only everyone at home knew that there would be more on the way soon. Hedgehog Day was just the start of a year-long strategy to sell Sonic the Hedgehog 3, and later, the second part of the game. Reviews came in after Hedgehog Day praising every aspect of the game. Electronic Gaming Monthly issued a score of 38 out of 40 in its March 1994 issue. The review crew lauded the new features of the game, including the shields and bonus levels, calling the game simply the perfect Sonic. GamePro issued a near-perfect score in March 1994. The review offered several pro tips for all the new features in Sonic 3, while commenting on the impressive visuals and challenges, concluding by calling Sonic 3 another spectacular game. Die Hard Game Fan issued a score in the low 90s in March 1994. The review remarked that Sonic 3 was familiar, but bigger and better, without being repetitive calling the game an amazing effort and a totally new and unique game of Sonic. Sonic 3 sold over a million copies in the US in 1994. A worldwide release soon followed. Sonic 3 landed in the UK and continental Europe on February 24, 1994. In the UK, Sega opted for a broader campaign than Hedgehog Day, commissioning UK group Right Said Fred to rewrite one of its songs Wonder Man to be a song all about Sonic that would serve as the theme song to the promotional campaign. The new single was released on March 7th that year, peaking at number 55 on the UK 100 singles chart. Alongside Wonder Man on CD, a music video of the group performing, interspersed with gameplay, hit the airwaves. Reviews in the UK and Europe were very positive, with most scores in the upper 90s. Sega Zone, in its March 1994 issue, gave a score of 93%. The review compared Sonic 3 to prior installments, wondering if Sonic has a formula good enough to last three games. In the end, the review concedes that the game can be finished rather quickly, but also declared Sonic 3 everything a game should be. Sega Power, also in March 1994, gave Sonic 3 a score of 90%. The article talked about the game's graphics at length, as well as the new power-ups and challenges. The magazine declared that Sonic 3 was an utterly pleasurable experience, the best Sonic yet, and one of the best Mega Drive titles around. Sales reached just over 470,000 units in the region. Along the way, Sonic 3 found its way to South Korea and Australia, leaving Sega's home country as the last place for release. In Japan, Sega held off Sonic 3 until May 27, 1994. With the game on sale around the world, the gaming media in Japan previewed the completed version for months. Some Japanese Mega Drive owners decided to import the game, which was reported on at the time, and quite unusual, given the trend that most games in the 90s were released in Japan first, long before ever going abroad. Some consider the Mega Drive to be a failure in Japan, simply for not outselling the rival Super Famicom and PC Engine. But Sega had secured a 20% market share in its home country, a respectable number, despite not being number one. In 1994, Sonic 3 sold over 200,000 copies in Japan. With Sonic 3 on sale around the world, Sega's long tail strategy for 1994 was paying off. Everything was falling into place as planned, with the second half of the biggest 16-bit game ever nearing completion. As things were finalized, the title of Sonic 3 Part 2 was made official, Sonic and Knuckles. The interface to connect the game with Sonic 3 was given a catchy name, Lock-On Technology. The potential release date was long penciled in since before Sonic 3 was ever an idea, and before Sonic 2 was completed. The Tuesday before Thanksgiving being the most likely date. November 22, 1994. Sonic and Knuckles with Lock-On Technology was publicly shown at several events in the summer of 1994. Gamers marveled at the possibilities that connecting two game cartridges could bring, on top of having the second full-sized Sonic game for sale in one year. 
Everything was lined up and ready to go. However, one unknown unknown hit Sega square in the face. Nintendo had been working on a Sonic killer game for the last two years. A game that looked 32-bit without any special add-on nor any special chips inside. Donkey Kong Country. The surprise reveal shocked everyone at the 1994 summer CES, stealing some of Sega's thunder. Another shot across the bow was the release date. November 21st. In 1994, it was the ultimate 16-bit showdown. Sega vs. Nintendo, Lock-On vs. Silicon Graphics, Sonic & Knuckles vs. Donkey Kong Country. The full story will be told right here on GTV this October. We'll see you there.